Are you ready for some Jersey? Well, we've got Jersey. The zipper was made here. The light bulb was made here. The color television calls the Garden State home. Everybody wants to know about New Jersey. Sandy beaches, beautiful cities. We even have the Jersey Turnpike. Inventors, music, the movies. You need an exit? We got them too. You want Jersey? This is Jersey. Welcome to this edition of This is Jersey. We're at Monmouth University today in Wilson Hall for the Sinatra, an American icon symposium. In honor of what would have been Frank Sinatra's centennial birthday year, Monmouth University and the Grammy Museum are hosting a day of discussion, music, and celebration for the chairman of the board. I have Grammy Museum Executive Director Bob Santilli with me to talk about Frank's influence on entertainment and New Jersey. Bob, this is an exciting day for you. You're involved as executive director of the Grammy Museum. Why right. bring the Grammy Museum here and, and why Frank Sinatra being the first artist? Well, the Grammy Museum is here at Monmouth University because it has a first-rate popular music studies program. And when the Grammy Museum started to look for university affiliates, that's the first thing we look for. That plus the fact that I am uh, an alum from here and it was really nice to be able to come back and make a connection again with the university, but that's pretty much the reason. Mm -hmm. Well, Sinatra, actually, this is his centennial and it's really not the first because two years ago we did something on the Beatles and uh, at the time, Monmouth University was not yet an affiliate. The affiliate program had not yet kicked off. But this is the second time that the Grammy Museum is back here at Monmouth University. And what do we expect when we have an affiliate program? Are there photographs and yeah. stories? Well, I'll give you an example here. There have only been three universities that have been selected to participate in the Frank Sinatra Centennial. One is the University of Southern California, the other one is Yale University and Monmouth University. So it's quite prestigious to have this particular seminar and symposium here. But in addition to that, we also are kicking off the premiere of the second Frank Sinatra exhibit. It's a photo exhibit and it premieres here today at Monmouth University, going to Yale University and then going to Palm Springs and that's it. So it's a very limited run, very limited um, presentation in terms of academia, but very prestigious universities that are participating. What do you expect young people and students to learn from uh, Frank Sinatra? Well, if you're from New Jersey, uh, you know, you've heard an awful lot about the boss and rightfully so but now you're gonna hear about the chairman of the board. Uh, he is a, obviously a Jersey native. He was born in Hoboken, but carried the essence of Jersey in him all his life. And if you're Italian American, if there are a lot of Italian Americans living in New, in New Jersey, myself like being Santilli, one, yeah. uh, you know, it, he means something even more than that. He carried the spirit of what it was meant to be an Italian American. He was a social activist. He was a great, great singer and performer, obviously, but there are a whole lot more about Sinatra that young people in particular should know about. You brought a lot of people here today, Max Weinberg, Southside Johnny and others. Tell us about the day and how this day is going to work. Well, the idea is to present Sinatra from many different points of view, whether we're looking at him as a social activist or as a musician, as a performer, recording artist, uh, as one of the greatest entertainers of the 20th century, try to create a cross-section of experts and people who have followed his career for a long time. So really what you're going to get is a variety of people, musicians looking at Sinatra from a musician's point of view, performers looking at Sinatra from a performer's point of view, collectors, historians, they're all here today. The Springsteen Collection is actually here at Monmouth University. I know you were a part of that. Tell me about that and how it got here and, and what someone could expect. The Bruce Springsteen Archives is located here at Monmouth University. It originally came from the Asbury Park Library, it brought here so that it could really live and thrive on an academic setting. It really is all about Springsteen from a variety of different things. There's oral histories here, there's performances, there are uh, newspaper clippings, magazine clippings from all over the world. There's ephemera of all different kinds. It really is the place now where the legacy of Bruce Springsteen now resides. There are many states in America that have a large and very, very uh, fruitful music legacy. Uh, Texas, uh, Mississippi, uh, California, certainly. But when it comes to Jersey, I think what happens is that there's a, uh, New Jersey is often seen as a a microcosm of America. There's so many ethnicities here, people who have come across the Atlantic and, and, and stayed here, carried their roots, their culture, et cetera. So we have this unique opportunity here to, to celebrate various kinds of immigrants and various kinds of music forms. And when people come out of Jersey, whether it's Bruce Springsteen, Frank Sinatra, Whitney Houston, The Four Seasons, 
Count Basie, so many more. Uh, you, you have a habit of carrying New Jersey roots with you. And people like now to be known that they're from New Jersey. It wasn't always that case, but with Sinatra and Springsteen and so many more, uh, New Jersey has a cool factor to it now. And that's one of the reasons why you hear oh, he's a Jersey artist or, or whatever it might be. We've seen the rebirth of Asbury Park, a real slow one, that's for sure. But I know you've been watching the shore since you've been alive. Tell me, what do you think is going to happen in, in Asbury Park? What should we expect? Well, Asbury Park, of course, musically speaking, it's, it's great golden era was the late 60s and through the 1970s. That's not going to come back again. It was a special time, a unique time and place in history. But the city is coming back and a new culture, a new era is beginning and that's really exciting because you have artists there, you have a new generation of musicians there, there's a new excitement with the coffee houses and the restaurants and the art galleries, so the city is coming back and of course the city always will be connected to this incredible legacy. You can go anywhere now in the music world. When I tell people I'm from uh, New Jersey, I live in California now, they'll immediately say, oh, Asbury Park. You know, they'll connect that right away. That's pretty special and it's legitimate. Uh, what happened in Asbury Park changed the course of American music in the 1970s. Asbury Park may be a huge influence on some of New Jersey's musical talent, but Frank Sinatra endures as an inspiration to musical careers all over the world. New Jersey's own Max Weinberg agrees. Frank Sinatra is at the heart of my musical career because uh, since I was a kid, his music particularly being a drummer, the rhythmic quality of it attracted me and fascinated me. And the fact that he was such a larger than life character, it was very big in my house as a kid growing up. So I was very well aware of Frank Sinatra, his music, his movies, his legend, and uh, I admired him. So it's the music I've actually listened to my whole life more than anything else. All 1,300 some odd songs that he recorded. His film career was extensive, as you know. I mean, he did it all, and he was really uh, such a groundbreaking singer. Vocalization, as you said, was his trade, but um, as a producer, as an actor, uh, of course we know about From Here to Eternity, but one of my favorite movies was Suddenly, which I saw maybe, I don't know, it was 10 or 11 years old, and he plays a bad guy in that movie. This hundredth year, it's a great opportunity to remember the man, the music, the legend, the impact, the social activism, the breadth of his career. Uh, I hope they do. Uh, I can recall not knowing that much about Rudy Valley when I was a young kid, but if you're interested in the music and the history uh, and pop music in particular, uh, you've got to include Frank Sinatra, so I hope they do. And no one sings about loneliness better than Frank Sinatra. The Day Symposium is part of the official affiliation between Monmouth University and the Los Angeles-based Grammy Museum. The partnership provides access to museum content for educational purposes, research projects, seminars, and student internship opportunities. University President Paul Brown is excited about the new partnership. The Grammy Museum has chosen Monmouth University. How has that influenced the university? Uh, it's been great, uh, mainly for our students, uh, but for our programs and just a lot more visibility. It's really fantastic. Mm -hmm. The event that we're here today is the Frank Sinatra Symposium. Uh, how has Frank Sinatra affected music, do you believe? Uh, I don't think we can probably capture it. Uh, I'm amazed how you have individuals from 8 to 18 to 88 that still mm -hmm. know his work. I just think it's very iconic in its foundation. I know the Grammys chose Monmouth because of the music department that you have here. Theater, you know, you guys do a lot in theater and the arts. Um, how are you growing in that area at Monmouth University? Well, frankly, one of our strongest growing areas is a major in the music entertainment industry. So it's about everything about the industry, both on the stage and behind the stage. And there's a huge growth in that area. You could work in any array of the area of the industry. And it's one of our fastest growing majors. I know you have a lot of performances at the Pollock Theater. How are you growing that area of, of what you do? You know, I'd like to fill that theater every night. We have a lot of opera. We have a lot of live shows. We have local artists. We have international artists. Each year, we've added about 10, 15% more programming at the Pollock Theater. 
You also have the Springsteen collection here, and I know you're real proud of that. How will that grow over the next five years? Oh, it will grow. We continue to get additional archival items coming our way. The biggest problem we could have is we'd be, need larger facilities to take all the materials that come our way. But we continually make it available for research, um, student engagement, and people on campus as well as anywhere throughout the U.S. that wants to come here. When we return, more information and insights from Sinatra, an American icon symposium. Welcome back to This Is Jersey. We're at the Sinatra, an American icon symposium at Monmouth University talking to renowned historian and author Chuck Granada about his experience with both Frank and Nancy Sinatra. Chuck, you're the like go-to guy for Nancy Sinatra. You do a lot with the Sinatra family. How did you get connected with them and do so much work for them? I am a very lucky guy, Gary, because I was brought into Sony Music which at the time, in 1992, controlled Frank's Columbia Records catalog. That's his first solo career from 1943 to 1952. They owned those recordings and they wanted to do the first major reissue, remastering and box set of all the, of those 1940s recordings. And they liked my work enough so that they hired me to all the Sinatra reissues at Sony Music. And that was 23 years ago. I was called by Nancy Sinatra, who asked me to work on her book that she was writing about her dad. And that work that we did over the course of a year and a half, which included a four CD set with a, a, a disc dedicated to each of Frank's individual eras and a booklet to go along with it with Nancy's reflective notes about why the songs she chose were so important. Um, she liked that and uh, from that, it blossomed into a really nice personal friendship. So through the years, uh, Nancy and I have been very close friends, and I've worked on some of her recordings by doing liner notes. I've, of course, in the intervening 23 years, produced a lot of Sinatra product box sets at Warner Brothers and uh, Sony Music. Back in 92, what did you learn about Frank Sinatra? What did you learn in the, in the early days about Frank Sinatra? Well, for me, I had been a Sinatra enthusiast and I had been studying the music and I had already started doing research for my first book. In doing that, I spoke with hundreds of musicians and songwriters and producers and recording engineers and other artists to get um, a real picture of how Frank worked in the studio. So I learned a lot from the family about how Frank approached things personally. You know, and, and I guess the greatest thing that I learned was that Frank was really a very modest guy believe it or not. For all of the celebrity that surrounded him, he was the guy who, as long as his friends were happy and his guests were happy, he would be very comfortable kind of slumming it, you know. So it wouldn't be unusual if he were serving guests at a, at a party at his home uh, for him to be in the kitchen eating a sandwich while his guests were maybe eating something a lot more fancy outside. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're there's a lot of complexity that goes along with Frank Sinatra as an artist and as a person. And I think having that personal insight from his daughter, I produced Nancy Sinatra's radio show at Sirius XM for the last eight years. And in doing so, uh, in crafting these shows each week um, and recording with Nancy on a weekly basis, I've gotten even more insight. And, and that insight has, has deepened my appreciation for Frank's music because it was very personal. This was something that he took very seriously. He wasn't just tossing it off. It wasn't an afterthought as it was for, let's say, Dean Martin, who was a phenomenal performer, but didn't really care a lot about his recordings. He didn't invest a lot of time and thought, whereas Sinatra crafted and, and spent in incredible time tending to every detail behind his recording sessions. And, th and that really has been amplified for me through Nancy Jr., Nancy Sr., and the other family members and people around the family that worked and lived with Frank at, you know, for all those years. We talked about Frank Sinatra, the musician, but what about the actor? What is your opinion on his, his acting and what have you learned? Gary, I was fortunate in 2003 to produce a six CD box set for Warner Brothers called Frank Sinatra in Hollywood. And the goal was to bring all of Frank's pre-recording session 
tracks that he made for his films together. And that really was a revelation for me. Of course, I always loved Frank as an actor in films like The Manchurian Candidate and Man with a Golden Arm and From Here to Eternity and of course, who doesn't love Anchors Away and On the Town. But when I started working on the Frank Sinatra and Hollywood project, which took about seven years to really research and assemble, um, I found that there was consummate professionalism on the part of Frank Sinatra when he was in front of the camera. There's this myth that Frank was a one-take kind of guy. And that may have been true in the film studio where they were doing a camera angle and doing an acting take. He always felt that his first take on anything was the freshest. It kind of got stale and boring after that. And he was probably right. But when it came to the recording side of his Hollywood career, he invested a tremendous, tremendous amount of attention into the work. And, and I, I also think if you watch films, the celebrated films, such as Manchurian Candidate and Golden Arm and From Here to Eternity and Suddenly, which is an all but forgotten Sinatra film from 1955, there's such a veracity in his acting. It's not like you're watching an actor. When I watch Venturian Candidate, I see someone really living the part. And that's really, to me, the most refreshing and interesting thing about Sinatra the actor, because he didn't go to acting school. He was not a trained actor. But being a singer, where you're really acting the lyrics and trying to express this emotion vocally without a visual, I think it was a natural progression for him. Also in attendance for the symposium panel was singer, songwriter, and Sinatra fan, Steve Forbert. He's like the center of the dial. He's like Beethoven is to, you know, the world of classical composers. When you're the best, you set the bar. There's no separation between what he's feeling and what you're receiving as, as, as a listener. Um, that's, that's truly great. You know, that's greatness. Um, and when you're the best, you set the bar. So what more contribution can you make than that? You know, it's like um, um, there's no separation between Picasso's arm and the finished work, the, the canvas, you know, his, or his mind and the canvas or the sculpture or whatever medium he was working in. And it takes a lot of people to make that a reality. Nelson Riddle's name will be mentioned a lot here today and some of the producers, those people, but the consistent thing through all of this and what we'll be talking about is Frank Sinatra's emotional ability as an artist, his con to convey what the words are saying and, and as, as we know later in his career Given the opportunity, he began to become meticulously involved in, as they say, every note of his arrangements and what they were going to be and to make sure they were all going to be pointing toward the same goal, the same end result. You know, when, uh, when they finally got everybody in the studio doing it all at one time, it would have been a thrill to be there. What sound most defined Frank Sinatra? I'm mainly interested in, in the, the reprise years. Everybody raves about the capital years. And some of that stuff is, you know, is, is, is wonderful. But by and large, I like the reprise, the later, the, that, that next phase, that later phase in his life. What he brought to that, and by the way, he was probably in maybe more control, if that's possible, of those recordings. I would think it, it should last for a very long time, that people will have the emotional uh, empathy to say that this is timeless. And th I certainly hope that's true. It won't be a, <laughs> it will be a change for the worse if people can't relate to Frank Sinatra.